Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. I'm Jim Helmer and in section 6.3 we're going to talk about exponential functions. Exponential functions have a lot of applications in biology, chemistry, uh, things in economics as well. Uh, some examples would be uh, radioactive decay. That's something that uh, you might explore in chemistry and you'll see that these would be exponential functions that describe the behavior of those substances. Uh, if we're going to explore exponential functions, let's first define what an exponential function is. If we have a function f of x equals a to the x, where a is our base and x is our variable, that is the essential aspect that we're looking at when it comes to exponential functions. Our variable is in the exponent. Now, our base, a in this case, has to be greater than 0, because if a is negative, it's not exponential. Uh, a cannot be equal to 1, and if we think about it, 1 to any power doesn't change, so it wouldn't have a constant growth or decay. Let's, uh, let's look at this example here. This is an exponential function where we have f of x equals 2 to the x. Essentially what this states is, for every value of x, this is going to increase by a factor of 2. It's going to double. So if uh, x is 1, well, we have 2. If we double that, when x is 2, we have 2 to the second, which is 4, and then 8, 16, 32, so on and so forth. So it's going to double each time by a factor of 2. If we look at our power function, this, our variable, is our base in this case. And if we recall all of our rules of power functions, yes, this is going to increase, but it's not constantly increasing on this side of y, on the negative side of x. It's actually decreasing in some area and increasing in another. If we look at our exponential function, it's always increasing. Uh, it could be always decreasing, but we notice it's only one direction. Now, one thing we have to know about exponential functions compared to power functions is an exponential function will grow much, much faster than a power function. And before we move on to, uh, to that, let's, let's think about our reference point when we dealt with power functions. Our reference point was 0, 0, in this case 0, 0, the vertex. Now we might have a transform left or right, up or down, it shifts the whole graph, but our reference point is that vertex. Well, when it comes to an exponential function, our reference point is 0, 1. And if we know our rules of exponents, and hopefully we're uh, very strong with our rules of exponents and know them inside and out, if we think about this point right here, it doesn't matter what the base is, anything to the 0 power, our input of x being 0, gives us 1. Anything to the 0 power is 1. So this is our reference point. And we might have some transforms, which we'll explore uh, shortly. And we could shift it up and down as well. Before we move on to that, I just want you to recall our power function in standard form would be a times x minus h squared plus k. And this is the form we'd want our quadratic so that we could graph it. And we can see the h value, the k value, and a. And if recall, if a is positive, it opens up. If a is negative, it opens down. Well, we can apply those same concepts to an exponential function. Let's just say some value b times a to the x minus h plus k. Now the h, again, is our transform, and it's always the opposite of what we see here. b is just some constant. If it's positive, this is increasing. If, if it's negative, it reflects it through the y-axis. Hopefully we recall from transforms our reflections. And k would just shift it either up or down, depending on what the value of k is. All right, let's explore exponential functions in a little bit more detail. Some of the properties of exponential functions. If you look here, we have constantly growing functions. The blue one here indicates a function where my base is 3, 3 to the x. So as x gets bigger, maybe we're uh, 0. 3 to the 0 is 1, and that's our reference point, 0, 1, right here. Uh, if x is 1, well, 3 to the first is 3. 3 to the second would be 9. 3 to the third would be 27. So you see, as we get further out, it's 
constantly increasing by a factor of 3. If we look at g of x, notice this one's increasing faster because it has a factor of 4. Its base is 4, so it's going to quadruple each and every time. And if we look at h of x r is 5 to the x, that's going to increase by a factor of 5 faster than the others. And this would be constant growth. So this is an exponential function, and our variable is in the exponent. Now before I cover domain range, the horizontal asymptote, and so on, let's look at this. Here we have exponential decay, where it's decreasing. Well, here our base was a value greater than 1. Well, if our value is between 0 and 1, because we can't have bases to be negative, that would not be an exponential function. If we look here, between 0 and 1, essentially a fraction or a decimal, an example would be 1 third to the x. Well, that's our blue line. It's decreasing by a factor of 1 third. So we're taking a third of it each time x gets uh, larger or moves to the right here. How come it's higher over here? Well, if we think about it, we're taking the reciprocal, a negative exponent. Well, a negative exponent is a reciprocal. As an example, 1 third to the negative second would be a positive 9. So that's some value way up here. So we notice these are constantly decreasing. The red indicates 1 fourth, so it's going to decrease even faster. 1 fifth is decreasing even faster than the previous examples. Now let's think about domain and range. Well, when it comes to exponential functions, I can put in any value for x. So I can. So if we assess that, our domain is all real numbers from negative infinity to infinity. But what about our range? Well, what do we notice about both of these graphs? They never drop below 0, and they never cross the x-axis. So if that's the case, 0, not including 0, we use a parenthesis to infinity. So these arrows go up, or these arrows go up, but they approach 0, depending on which type of exponential function we're looking at, growth or decay. So what does this mean? Well, it means it has a horizontal asymptote. If we recall limits, what's the limit for this one as x approaches negative infinity? Well, it gets closer and closer to 0. If we look at this, what happens as x goes to positive infinity? Well, it approaches the x-axis. It gets closer and closer to 0. So it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Well, what about the x-intercept? Well, if its horizontal asymptote is y equals 0, and without any transform to shift it up or down, it doesn't cross my y or my x-axis. So it has no x-intercept. The y-intercept, in both of these cases, without a transform, we see that that value is 0, 1. Again, that's our reference points if we do apply transforms, which we'll see shortly. Now, one thing we also want to keep in mind is these are one-to-one -one functions. Not only do they pass the vertical line test, they would also pass the horizontal line test. And that's an important concept, because in the next section, in 6.4, we're actually going to explore the inverse operation of exponent, which is a logarithm. So keep that in mind. Let's move on to applying transforms to this. Now, on the first board, I had wrote the power function, a to the x minus h squared plus k. And I'm just going to put it up there. We can apply those same concepts to this. If a is positive, it, our parabola opened up. Well, if a is positive in this example, we're going to have an increasing uh, function. It's not going to be reflected through our x-axis. Well, if we look at this, this is my h value. Just how does it affect x? Well, I have x minus 2. That's going to shift my function two values to the right. Out here, what am I adding to the function? There is no k value. So we can apply these concepts that we applied to parabolas. We can apply to exponential functions. So let's explore this. The horizontal asymptote, well, there's no vertical shift. So it is y equals 0. It's not going to cross that x-axis. It's only going to approach it. The x-intercept, well, if this is true and it doesn't cross, there is no x-axis or no x-intercept. 
The y-intercept, well, let's explore that. The y-intercept is when x is 0. So if I put 0 into here, 0 minus 2 is negative 2. 3 to the negative second is 1 ninth, the reciprocal of 3 squared. Our domain, well, our domain doesn't change. I can put in any value for x. So I'll just write the symbol for all real numbers. You could write that in interval notation. The range. Well, since there's no transform vertically, our range is from 0 to infinity. So let's go ahead and graph this. But let's think of it in terms of transforms. Well, anything to the 0 power is 1. So if I start at 0, 1, I'm going to use this transform. It says to shift it 2 to the right. My h value is a positive 2. It's always of the form x minus h. So I'm just going to go over 1, 2. That is my reference point, shifted over 2. I also have this point here, 0 and 1 ninth. Well, that's pretty close to the x-axis, but not quite there. And we know the general shape is constantly growing. So that is the graph of my exponential function. And I know its behavior. It has a horizontal asymptote. It has no x-intercepts. We know the y-intercept, domain, and the range. And we can see. This is growing exponentially. We had a value of the base greater than 1, and it was shifted to the right two spots. Let's take a look at an application. Where do we see this value? Well, the application would be an in interest. When you go to the bank and maybe you borrow money or you put money into an account that's earning interest, this is our compound interest equation where A is the amount of money we receive if we invest some principal P into an account bearing R percent interest and compounded N amount of times raised to the number of compounds times time in years. Now N, N could be annually, which just means once a year, or semi-annually, twice a year, or quarterly, or monthly, or daily, so on and so forth. So let's, let's explore what happens as we allow n to approach infinity, the, our variable here. Because notice that n is in the exponent, so this is an exponential equation. Let's make it real easy and say our principal, we're going to invest $1, and our interest rate is going to be 100% for one year. So we make things real nice. So we have 1, essentially 1, and 1. Well, what happens as the number of times we compound this interest when we earn interest on our interest? Let's see what happens. Well, if uh, t is one year, in a year's time, where n is one compounding, we're compounding it annually, we essentially double our money. We get 100% return. Well, if we compound it twice, semi-annually, which means six months into the year, they're going to add my interest and then Six months later, after a whole year, I earned interest on that six months of interest. Well, if we put that into this equation and crunch it in our calculators, we get 2.25. Because what's happening is this value, as n increases, gets smaller, but it's also being raised to a larger value. So it's a smaller value, but it's being uh, multiplied by itself more times. If we put in 4, Notice the value is getting larger, 2.44. The more times we compound it, the more time, you know, the more money we're going to earn interest on our interest. Well, we notice as it gets to 12, we have 2.61. So here we, we got 20 more cents. Here we got 20 more cents. What if we allow it to go to 365, which is a pretty big increase in the number of compoundings, but that makes this much smaller but that much bigger, we notice it doesn't increase that much, 2.715. And I carried it out to an extra decimal so we can see. Well, what if we allow n to go to infinity? What happens? Well, <clears throat> this number here gets infinitely small because n is going to infinity. But we're raising it to an infinite power. So if we think about it, it's getting infinitely small and infinitely large at the same time. 1 plus essentially nothing raised to the infinite power. Well, 1 to the infinite power would just be 1, 1 to any power. But if we think about it, it's not exactly 1, is it? It's 1 plus a little tiny bit. So what happens? Well, as we approach infinity, we start to come to a number, a limit. And that limit is 2.71828. 
which is the natural number that we call e. We use a lowercase e to denote that. Now, this is a constant that you should get familiar with. Uh, you, you see it quite a bit, especially in your classes like biology and maybe physics. Uh, you'll see it in chemistry as well. This number is just like pi. Pi is an irrational number, 3.14159265, while e is just like pi, except it stands for a different value, a limit. And this number rears its head in many applications as we approach infinity one way or the other. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the function f of x equals e to the x, or f of x or g of x equals negative e to the x. Now, this is a function exponential growth because this is positive, right? We have e, which is at 2.718 raised to some x value. We notice our reference point doesn't change. Its domain and range are still the same as the other exponential functions we looked at, but it's growing by a factor of e, and e is just that irrational number. Well, what about this one? g of x equals negative e to the x. Well, this one has constant decay because it's negative. We have a reflection through the x-axis. But we see now our reference point is 0, negative 1, reflected through the axis. Now, this number you, you can treat just like any other base. It's just a new number. If you haven't seen it before, just realize it's a number just like pi. And you'll see it quite frequently in this class from this point forward. Well, we can apply this information to exponential equations. Let's think about how do we solve an exponential equation. Well, we know our variable is in the exponent. Well, our base is going to be greater than 0 and not equal to 1, because anything 1 to any power doesn't change. So we're going to exclude that value. This is the concept we're going to use to try and solve some equations in this section. If I have a base to the x power, equal to that same base to the y power, well, if the bases are the same, in order to be equal, their powers have to be the same. So x must equal y in this example. So that's the key when it comes to solving exponential equations. If we can write them to have the same base, we can then solve for their exponents. If I look at this one, my base is 3, and I can't simplify 3. It has no uh, factors other than 1 in itself. So I'm going to leave it as such, 3 to the x squared plus 4x. But 1 27th, if I think about 27, well, that's the same as 3 times 3 times 3 if I factor it down. Well, it's the reciprocal of 27, or the reciprocal of 1 over 3 to the third power. So let's take that reciprocal just by changing the sign of its exponent. Now, hopefully, we recall our rules of exponents, and this isn't something that shocks you. So now we see that. They have the same base, which means they must have the same exponent. So x squared plus 4x must equal negative 3. Now this is essentially a quadratic that I can solve using other methods. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to set it equal to 0. x squared plus 4x plus 3 equals 0. And this factors to x plus 3 x plus 1 equals 0. And we just use the zeros of this here. x would equal negative 3 and negative 1. And we can always check our work. Let's plug negative 1 in here. Negative 1 squared is 1. Negative 1 times 4 would be negative 4. 1 minus 4 is negative 3. 3 to the negative third is 1 27th. That's a true statement. We've already seen that right here. 3 to the negative third was the same thing as 1 27th when we wrote it to have the same base as 3. Well, what about negative 3? Well, negative 3 squared is a positive 9. Negative 3 times 4 is a negative 12. 9 minus 12 is negative 3. 3 to the negative third is, again, 1 27th. So both of these solutions of x equals negative 3 and negative 1 both hold true. Well, let's take a look at this. Now, if we observe this, here's where we really need to know our rules of exponents. Everything has the same base, but we should simplify this a little bit more. We have multiplication of the same bases to powers. 
Well, that's our product rule of exponents. That means if the bases are the same, I can add their exponents. So I'm just going to rewrite this. e to the x squared plus 4x equals e to the 12th. Now that I've done that step using my rules of exponents, I can see, oh, it's just like this. They have the same base. Now this exponent is equal to that exponent. So again, I can say x squared plus 4x equals 12. This power equals that power. And now we can solve it using our quadratic methods. And we see x squared plus 4x minus 12 equals 0, which factors to x plus 6, x minus 2 equals 0. So our values are x equals negative 6 and positive 2. And we can go ahead and check those. And we'll see that that does hold true. If I put negative 6 in here, negative 6 times 4 is negative 24. Negative 6 squared is a positive 36. And since we're multiplying the same base, if I add these, I get 12. So that's a true statement. I didn't really even have to involve myself with that value of e, that 2.718, so on and so forth. If I try 2, I get 8 plus 4 is 12. Again, a true statement. So both of my solutions work. Now, here's your quiz. I want you to try this for yourself. Make sure you truly understand your rules of exponents. What I have here, my goal is to write them as the same base. If you can write 2, 4, and 8 to all have the same base, then you can essentially use your rules of exponents, simplify this, and then build your equation. So hopefully we remember the quotient rule of exponents. So give that a try. This has been section 6.3, exponential functions. Thank you for watching.